from Microbe TV. This is Immune, episode number 42, recorded on March 22nd, 2021. I'm Vincent Bracaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hi again. Welcome back. How are you? I'm well. How about you? You're still working at home, I see, right? Uh, a couple days a week I work at home, a couple days I go into the office, yep. Also joining us from Durham, North Carolina, Steph Langle. Hi. Yes, I am in Durham, not in Raleigh, not at home. I'm in the office, coming into lab, you know, on, on shifted schedules, but here. You know, from Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm at home based on whether or not I have all Zoom meetings or actually time to be in the lab each day. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're five minutes from the lab, so it's not I an am. issue, right? Well, you I can might change go your over mind. I might go over it later. <laughs> I'm the farthest, and I think... I don't know, Cindy and Steph, you're probably similar commutes, right, from your labs? About 10 minutes. Oh, okay. I'm about 25. I'm about 25. But yeah, Vincent, I think of you often and, and because, as you all know, my wonderful boss, Sally, is leaving to New York. I'll, she has started in the lab moves in June. And when I was thinking about, I mean, I wasn't going to go to New York, but if I had thought about it, I thought about Vincent, like that commute is so far. I mean, I could live in the city, but it's expensive. Yeah, you could. Because Although with a kid, it's hard, you know. No, got kids, got dogs. I mean, we just, when we insane. started thinking about, when we were thinking about having kids, we left the city, you yeah. know, yeah. because we could. I mean, we had a one bedroom, and you know what? Some people raise three kids in a one bedroom in New York. Yeah, right. I'm not doing that. To make it work <laughs> with a big I dog too, right? <laughs> and people can make it work, yeah. And yeah. the kids grow up being resourceful and all that. They are, but yeah. I didn't want to do it, so we left. And so I had, a, I have a big commute. That's all right. So before oh, we good. get into our, you know, our fun today, we have a lot of fun, non-COVID fun. Um, I'm just curious, like, how are you guys doing? What's going on? What's a, what's a little update? I have news. Okay. As of April 1st, I get promoted to full professor. So that's <gasps> hey, something good. to celebrate. So yay. Congrats. Yay. Congrats. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's professor. wonderful. Pandemic, Pandemic professor. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that's wonderful. Very I'll happy for you. I, that. Do you have like champagne near you? you pop it. And, is it too early? <laughs> I kind of already celebrated a little bit. Yeah, but we can oh, okay. pop another bottle on <laughs> April 1st. And well, it's not good. a joke <laughs> on April 1st. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> it is for how real. Are, uh, how are infections in Ithaca? Is it, is it quite quieted down? You know, we had a spike, or we have a mm. spike. Um, the students have gotten tired of following rules, and they were yeah. not following rules. Course, and, yeah. Um, yeah, we were having a good number of cases per day, and that, you know, that uh, probably to the listeners out there is going to sound like a joke, but in the twenties, um, but that's that's a lot more than one or two per day that we were having a month or two ago. So mm. you know, mm. we're getting there. I had got my first mm. dose of vaccine too, so that's also fantastic news. Um, good, very so, good. Yep. So things are starting to look up. I, I think it's so funny. Everywhere there's a spike, it's because people are misbehaving yet <laughs> some people want to blame it on the variants right oh yeah, yeah. i know it brings just, the people human are tired yeah. they're just tired of following the rules yeah sure mm -hmm. for sure it's Maybe nice outside they, they want to go party yep definitely you can't, How about you, Brian? can you imagine I, I, being I, a I, freshman in college and no. all you can do and, is stay in your just, room and go to right. classes online maybe you have one or two classes in person if you're lucky that's you, hard. You, yeah, I, you I probably would have broke the rules would be awful. too. <laughs> right. Uh, there Brianne, are some what students been who like staying yeah. in the room. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, uh, I I am teaching lots of classes and trying to get summer research planned, but I have uh, I have a full slate of classes uh, this semester, so they keep me plenty busy. Um, and we are also having a spike both on Drew's campus in Madison and in New Jersey in general. Yeah, yeah. We got a scathing. I don't know, it was scathing, but it was just basically <laughs> calling out, um, particularly men of the Duke East campus, and that was honed in on a particular fraternity and their um, whatever they were up to activities. And so then the whole campus got shut down for a time, and now it's back open. So, oh wow, yeah. 
Well, yeah, Duke uh, got out of the ACC tournament because somebody tested positive. That's huge. It, they did. As a Duke alum, um, I get all of those uh, oh, did you things get as well as, you know, as well as various angry alum memes about it. So oh, I, I'm up on that. <laughs> <laughs> Vincent, are you recording just as quickly as ever? Some great ones yeah, this multiple week. Multiple times a week. Yeah. I mean, we have usually three twibs a week, but... Wow. Um, this week, I'm I, I just two because I, I have a class. Actually, tomorrow, Theodora Hatsuanu and I are both co-teaching a lecture at mm. Einstein. Nice. <laughs> so that should be fun. Nice. That'll together be fun. We put, yeah. and so we're going to do it together. So I canceled TWIV tomorrow, but I have Immune today. I have um, TWIVO on Wednesday. And yeah, TWIVO then, usually uh, coincides Wednesday. with when we... Because they are, you guys are one. Yeah, it's though. always the same week. Same yeah, week. Yeah. I would like to try and stagger one of them, but we could do that. Then Let's Wednesday know. night I have live stream on YouTube. Then Thursday and Friday we have Twiv, and then wow. I have my lectures, which require me to do some audio and pr- video processing as well. So right. it's like as soon as I finish something, I process. <laughs> it's okay. You're like a machine. I don't mind. <laughs> Okay. I, the the good the news here is that Daniel Griffin and I are renting office studio space in Manhattan. Oh, uh, no kidding. Wow. It's going to be downtown by uh, Penn Station, so it's accessible to trains. I'm and very excited idea, to take the train there. Yeah, wow. the idea is that, I mean, we have an optimal, I'm going to build out a great studio, right, where I can do most of the recording. We want to make courses and lectures, and, and if anyone's yeah. in town, they can come by and do a pod, you know. So mm, that should be fun. Cool. And it'll and the space for the studio is huge, you know, big white walls would be really nice to set up. And so I, I will go there most of the, I'm gonna start taking the train in when that happens. I won't drive anymore and go right there. And when I need to go to Columbia, I go uptown in the subway. So it's like oh, wow. the that next phase of my career. Mm. Yeah. That's fantastic. That yeah. So if you're ever in New York, you have to stop by. Yeah, definitely. In, in person when we're, you know, traveling <laughs> again. It's close to, you know, the train, so it should be easy for... So it's an interesting neighborhood. It's the former garment district where they yep. used to make clothing, right? Mm-hmm. But there's no more. It's gone. <laughs> and yeah. so all these empty buildings and the rent is pretty reasonable and they're nice spaces. And one of the buildings I looked at, I, I always look at what other offices are there. They're like three or four offices per floor. One of them was a podcast. Oh, <laughs> they had offices, <laughs> and the podcast was called True Crime. <laughs> oh, oh, is that true? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've listened yeah. To that. Yeah, yeah. It's really? Cool. Mm-hmm. No, they have their offices on Eighth Avenue in New York City. Yeah, no, no kidding. It's fun. So yeah, it's, it's going to be a fun time. Anyway, sweet. So today is a non-COVID day. Cool. I'll probably sneak a little bit in there. <laughs> Maybe at <laughs> okay. the end, a couple of emails. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. Let's go. Uh, Cindy, what's up? What do we have? Yeah. Here? So uh, we had a request from from Steph, actually, to do a revisit of some uh, chimeric antigen receptor information. Uh, we did the podcast, gosh, it was about two years ago, right? Yeah, yeah it was. I, I listened to, to it and intimidated myself because it was such a fabulous episode. I was like, how am I going to top that? <laughs> oh, so, you'll be know. great. We'll see, how, we'll see how we do. <laughs> <laughs> now we have video components to enhance it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny because now if I open the show notes, I can't see you guys. So hopefully, I'm I'm looking somewhere towards I you, wish. but I, I won't be able to see your, <laughs> your reactions as we do this. But yeah, so we wanted to come back mm-hmm. and revisit chimeric antigen receptor uh, T cells and what's new. You know, what what are the cool new things that have come out? Um, have we gotten anywhere in the last few years? And in some in some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. And so I thought it would be really good to kind of right. revisit what they are and how they work first, just so we can remind those who might not have listened to our previous previous episode. But I will tell you, if you're interested in more detail about Sweet. the basics of CAR-T, it's, it, we really do a fantastic job describing it in the previous episode. Um, so, so what exactly is chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy? So it is an incredibly... Uh, powerful, newer technology that uses um, a completely synthetic uh, receptor um, that's basically, I called it smooshing together 
the recognition mechanisms from B cells to the signaling mechanisms of T cells. And basically what it right. is, yeah. is the a, a part of an antibody that specifically recognizes an antigen that's on, for example, a tumor cell. So we'll focus primarily on cancer because that's most of what it's been used for up to this time. And so what happens is you harvest a patient's blood and then you genetically modify the T cells by introducing this engineered sci-fi receptor into them. And so it has this part of an antibody that recognizes the tumor cell and it has components on it that signal to the T cell and activate the T cell. And if you're familiar with what kinds of T cells we have, we have CD8 T cells and CD4 T cells. And so these are primarily CD8 T cells because those are killer T cells or cytotoxic T cells. So they're armored with, armed with um, little vesicles that they can deploy to kill cells that they interact with. And so the antibody allows them to interact specifically, hopefully, with the tumor cell. And then um, they get triggered to deploy these little uh, perforin and granzyme containing vesicles and kill the tumor cells. And this works really, really well for what we call liquid tumors. So those are lymphomas and leukemias. And primarily it's been used against B cell cancers because the primary antigen that the antibody, the SCFE or fragment of the antibody is targeting is a molecule on the surface of all B cells called CD19. And so the power of it is those T cells will go and they will seek out and destroy all of the B cells. So they will eliminate the cancer and it works a fair amount of the time. Um, although about 20% of the time it doesn't work at all. Uh, and the, one of the big limitations is that it doesn't, it hasn't really worked very well to date on solid tumors. And we'll come to why that might be and some of the newer technologies that have come around to um, combat that. So this has gone through multiple right. iterations where the signaling domain that's on the, um, the cytoplasmic side of this receptor that triggers the T-cells started out with just a component of the T-cell receptor and then has added on um, co-stimulatory molecule signaling domains to improve the activity. And then we've also uh, seen more than one co-stimulatory domain added on to improve it further. And then more recently, they've started adding cytokines um, that get co-expressed with these cars in order to boost the activity and maintain <clears throat> the survival and proliferation of the T cells. So what questions uh, or things should we talk about right, um, to remind us where we yeah. are? Well, so one of the things that I find um, really interesting and sort of important to think about is what is the antigen and mm -hmm. how specific are these CAR T cells? Um, because I think that that's both right. a huge pro of CAR T cell therapy um, and a reason why we think of this as being a tumor therapy, um, maybe as opposed to some other things, but also is a little bit of a limitation um, mm -hmm. And when I started, when I first learned about some of the other applications like the autoimmune disease, mm -hmm. um, CAR T cells, mm -hmm. um, I remember thinking about that and being very curious about how that could work. And it was largely because of those same specificity issues. That's right. So the, the most, of, most of the applications of this have been to remove B cells. Right. And so it's B cell tumors. Mm -hmm. And the beauty is that all the B cells express CD19, and so that's the the target antigen. And the 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 um, sort of caveat or beauty of this is that people can kind of survive without B cells as long as they get infusions of immunoglobulins, polyclonal immunoglobulins. <laughs> and we've heard a lot about that. With we could talk about COVID nineteen, but um, with COVID nineteen <laughs> therapy, um, people have gotten injected with either monoclonal or polyclonal antibodies to the virus to help them fight off the virus. And so you can imagine that if you eliminate all your B cells, you're eliminating virus specific B cells, but you're also eliminating if you have autoimmunity, autoimmune B cells, or if those B cells are actually the cancer, you eliminate them. But the problem is, is that the T cells will eliminate 
all of the B cells, whether they're healthy, normal, malignant, autoimmune, or it doesn't matter. It's just they have CD19 and you get rid of them. And so um, right. it often gets rid of the precursors in the bone marrow too, so they really don't repopulate well, or um, sometimes the uh, CAR T cells remain in the blood for, we've seen up to over 10 years that they remain in the blood. And so they continue to kill all the B cells that come out of the bone marrow later anyway. Um, but if you have this immunoglobulin therapy, you can support those patients, but you can get rid of their tumor. So there's goods and bads on both sides. Yeah. And there, there are some research related, this hasn't gotten to the clinic at all, uh, ideas about how you could have, say, a bispecific receptor or have two receptors. Mm -hmm. So you might be able to make that CAR T cell a bit more specific so that it was hitting the B, B cell and something that was specific to a tumor. Um, and so yeah, you they call get those a little bites, more specific. Correct? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, I think so. Do they call I've it a couple bites, things. Bites, bispecific. Yeah. yeah. I've heard think, a yeah. couple yeah. things. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, we yeah, talked about it a little bit at the end of the last episode where we had the Boolean plus minus signals. You could either give them a negative signal. So if there's something mm -hmm. on a normal B cell that's not on the tumor, you could overcome that positive signal that's provided by the car or you could require two positive signals if there's another antigen. But the catch is you, you have to come up with a tumor-specific antigen. Right. And that's right. really... That's really the problem. No matter what you do with CAR therapy or which cell type you use or anything, it's having a tumor-specific antigen. And one of the problems that you know we can come back to is the heterogeneity of solid tumors. They're not always caused by the same mutations. Um, it's more likely that these uh, you know AML and you know leukemias are caused by very similar translocations or mutations. So you can frequently try and identify them, and it's it's a little bit easier than some of the the solid tumors. Right, and then there's also, as Cindy mentioned, you know, there is a proportion of people who do not respond, even even for you know liquid cancers, they they don't respond to CAR T cell therapy, and it could be because maybe they're B cell lymphoma, it's now a CD19 negative. Um, they, they, the, those receptors have been either sequestered or for whatever reason, um, it's it's migrated to a myeloid lineage. And so then you have to change, you have to adapt. And and this is very expensive. So when, when Cindy mentioned bringing your own body cells, that's autologous, you have to, it's, it's very expensive to take those out and to engineer them. There's not like an off the shelf type of a treatment where you can have the same, you know, um, healthy individuals maybe donating be cells because you can imagine that you're more likely to reject those. So th there's a lot of, uh, there are roadblocks that have then inspired, you know, engineering these things to, to try different avenues to, to be able to protect against cancer. Yeah. And I think that that, you know, brings up this important point of the fact that this is very much a personalized therapy. Uh, mm -hmm. Steph mentioned uh, sort of the, how expensive and costly it is. There's not something off the shelf. Um Mm -hmm. I was do, was researching one of the types of CAR T cells um, before this episode, and it just so happened the article one of the articles that came up when I put in the name um, had the price in the title <laughs> um, that said that it was four hundred and ten thousand dollars. Yeah, for <laughs> yep. kick in the head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's it's super expensive, and so or, and it, but it what's work. interesting? I mean, so <laughs> yeah, so with every stage. So like there's first generation, second generation, all these generations of CAR T cell therapy is usually it's adding a different component. So these are very nuanced therapies. So the co-stimulatory molecules, they can either, they could potentially make it easier for the T cells to get to the tumor or make them more pro-inflammatory. And then there's um, downstream signaling that you can play with. Um, but in the end, the tumor is still fine. Solid tumors are still finding ways to evade immunity, whether they have multiple different you know, antigens on the surface, or they are secreting things that are blocking the ability of T cells to, to make it there. Immunosuppressive factors. And that's true of, you know, that's a general tumor immunology fact that Absolutely. many of those solid mm -hmm. tumors are immunosuppressive. Yep. Right. Yep. That, so, so, so that, that's a, that's one of the major challenges is, you know, how do you overcome the immunosuppressive environment of the tumor? So some of the ways that they're, they're getting around that is adding these cytokines that will boost the inflammatory environment in the tumor. 
So that helps to overcome some of that suppressive um, response. Um, there's also some tweaking of, I, I, we could, we can discuss this now or we can go along, but basically, um, s they're now engineering the CAR T cells to secrete the anti PD one antibodies themselves. So not, not right. injecting the anti PD one antibodies or, um, having the, having B cells make the antibodies, but actually have the T cells secrete the antibodies. So where they go, they're actually secreting, the antibodies that will then block those negative signals, and so those those. P and actually, I don't think we define P one. Yeah, I was going to say we should probably mention that because since the since the last episode, <laughs> the um, Nobel Prize was awarded for these anti PD one. You know, these the discovery of the reg negative regulation of T cells. So the um, the T cells when they're stimulated will upregulate these molecules that dampen their response. And these two main ones are PD-1 and CTLA-4. And so when those were discovered, we realized that you could block those signals and potentially reinvigorate T cells, either from being um, exhausted or, sh or suppressed or even just uh, polyclonally activating them. And so that's one of the immunotherapies, not a CAR therapy, but an immunotherapy using antibodies that's been used in cancer as well is what we call these checkpoint inhibitors. So they block the checks that the T cells have mm -hmm. to shut down their response. And so when you pull the brakes off, the T cells go crazy. Um, and they can, yeah. you know, if there are specificities towards tumors there, they can kill the tumor. Yeah. So um, PD-1 in particular is a really interesting one. Um, so PD-1 is often um, turned on on T cells that are activated um, as an off switch uh, and can sort of, you know, is often on T cells that are basically exhausted. So those T cells that have seen chronic antigen stimulation, that same antigen for a long time. Um, and I'm always right. very happy because when I get to talking about T cell exhaustion and activation, I'm usually at a point of the semester where my students understand the phrase exhaustion um, really well. <laughs> so we, um, uh, you know, they're expressing sort of chronic, that's what you're saying. They're, they are chronically <laughs> stimulated and they are exhausted um, and they get that concept quite well. Um, but you can imagine that a T cell that might be responding to a tumor is likely to be exhausted as that tumor is um potentially expressing self-antigens that are there for a long period of time and that tumor is present yeah. for a long period of time. So those T cells may get to be exhausted. That may be one of the parts of the immunosuppression that we mentioned before. And so being able right. to turn off that exhaustion mechanism is really important. And I love this idea of having the antibodies come from the T cells because then you don't have to worry about delivering them to yeah. the right location. The T cells trafficking right, ability right, because kind of helps most you of out. the therapy is is iv and in injection yep mm -hmm. yeah right right yeah cool so some of the so that's that's one of the the d developments that people have been working on um one of the big problems and we've already raised this is this idea of on target off tumor toxicity so the idea that the normal right. cells are also expressing these markers that you're targeting and you're going to eliminate those normal cells as well. So those idea, the idea of those two signals required is one of the newer developments that people are using to try and overcome that. Um, some of the other things that are really um, a big problem with this CAR therapy are the toxicities associated with it. A lot due to that off-tumor on target toxicity, but as well as just the idea that you're massively activating these T cells that you put in the body that are trying to fight the tumor. And so there's a lot of things like what's called cytokine release syndrome, which people maybe have heard that because that's also associated with acute viral infections like SARS-CoV-2 and COVID. And there's also <laughs> neurotoxicity, so immune effector cell-associated neurotoxicity syndrome, or also called ICANS. So, so developing um, treatments to, to manage those severe toxicities associated with this CAR-T therapy is also a growing and evolving field. And as you can imagine, targeting things like IL-6, TNF, IL-1, and using those combination antibodies to block those inflammatory signals are some of the newer developments that they're using along with these CAR therapies as well. Um, but the big one right. 
is really graft versus host disease, right? So this is a problem that you have if you don't have the T cells from your own patient. So this idea of, so autologous versus allogeneic. And so if you harvest the T cells from the individual, those T cells grew up in that host environment and they've been educated and they will not fight the tissue unless you're asking them to. However, if you take Steph's T cells and inject them into my body, they're going to get ramped up right away and start killing things. And it's going to be a graft versus host disease. This is a really big problem and why there's such a limitation in being able to have something that's off the shelf, right? So how would you guys try and address this problem? So if, if, if I were going to take, uh, Brianne's T cells and make them an off the shelf therapy to try and put an in, engineer in a car and inject it into me or into Vincent. Can you think of a way that we would try and get rid of that ability of the graft to reject the host? Get rid of MHC. Get rid of MHC. Yeah, I was going right. to say MHC yeah. on target yeah. cells. Right. But Could I then, just get rid of the PCR on the the cells mm-hmm. I'm putting in? That's, that's yep. it. So, so, so remember that one of the things you're doing here is you're taking the patient's own T-cells and mm-hmm. then you're sticking in this uh, synthetic T-cell receptor that has on it a part that's actually an antibody, right? But you haven't gotten rid of their endogenous T-cell receptors. So they're going to have those original specificities as well. And so now that mm-hmm. we have gene editing technologies where you can go in and use CRISPR and surgically remove the T-cell receptor gene, Mm. the endogenous one that's being expressed, now you can reduce that um, graft versus host disease because that that T-cell receptor is actually required by mechanisms we don't have to go into detail on right now, but there's an allogenetic, allogeneic reaction where those foreign T-cell receptors will recognize to a small degree the foreign MHCs and just trigger a response. This is why you can't mix lymphocytes in a culture. (laughs) You just have to take out the one specificity that's an issue because this is how it works via the T-cell receptor to begin with, right? Right. Well, so remember, each T-cell is going to express a different T-cell receptor. And so you basically just have to cut out whichever one they're expressing. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it it sort of depends on whether that original T-cell that you modified was one original clone of a T-cell or whether it was a bulk population. If it was a bulk population, you have to take out every single one's right. T-cell receptor. If it was a clone, right. then just take out that clone's receptor. Right. And I think well, what you could also do... A, yep, go ahead. Well, I was say, the other thing, because I think the TCR, you know, probably does play a role in, in the effectiveness. And, and so maybe removing all TCR receptors could be problematic for efficacy at getting to the tumor site. So could you play with the level? Could you have the levels be low enough that they're not going to trigger, you know, graft versus host disease, but enough there that once they get to the tumor, then they're they're more efficacious. Imagining Possibly. levels. It's I a think very what nuanced. they've been working on is. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think what they've been working on is trying to identify um, conserved regions of the T-cell receptor gene locus that you can use to remove pretty much any endogenous TCR that would be expressed by Mm -hmm. any of the polyclonal population of T-cells that you have. But yeah, but that's the idea, right? Um, And, you know, we're not there yet. We really only have Still, so when we when we talked about this last time, we had two approved therapies, and now as of February fifth, twenty twenty one, we have three. So there, there really hasn't been a lot of movement, oh, and right. <laughs> and the reality is, all three are against the same target for basically the same disease, which are these B cell lymphomas. So, in the essence, we haven't made directed. a whole lot of progress. Mm-hmm. It's all CD19. It's all acute lymphoblastic lymphoma or diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So there really, isn't, there really isn't any other disease that they're approved for yet, although there's many, many, many clinical trials that are ongoing <laughs> on other, other targets. So things like new targets on B cells that might be more specific to for example, a uh, multiple myeloma versus just every B cell or other tumor antigens for other tumor so- solid tumor types. But yeah, so that so there's a lot of phase 1 trials but it were phase 1 twos for solid tumors and for other tumor types but no phase 3 is yet. 
So we're still quite a ways off right. from expanding out from targeting only CD19 on only B cell lymphomas. Yeah, Cindy, <laughs> uh, Cindy, Cindy for, yeah. for those for those B cell lymphomas, what's the efficacy of success roughly? Do we know? Um, Is it less I than 50 or more? So, so the interesting thing is for ALL, uh, the traditional therapy is pretty pretty successful. I think it's 80% mm. uh, success rate. Mm. So I think this increases that overall if you add this on or use this in, in addition to that. We're not at 100%, but it's pretty good. I mean, I think the efficacy of treatment of ALL overall is over 80 to 85% or 90%. And they didn't know that the, ALL is the most common type of cancer. Is that true? Mm, I think Cindy. I don't is that know that if that, I don't, am oh. I frozen? I, I was just I looking at the notes. I don't know if that's the <laughs> most common type. I, I think it's okay. one of the most common types of childhood tumors. Oh, okay. Um, but that I must don't, be what this is referring to. I just was reading the for, notes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I would, okay. I would assume that some kind of skin cancer is the most common type. Mm, I gotcha. believe it's actually so. Actually, yes. breast cancer. Oh. Breast, breast cancer. cancer. Or, yeah. Yeah, I think they're pretty. pretty oh yeah, I'm rereading. I just read that wrong in the notes. Melanoma. It is among children. Got it. <laughs> That's okay. Cool. I was starting to think like, <laughs> what did I put in the in our show notes? I'm not sure. No, um, <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so I some some of the more interesting progress though has made in been made in this area of like are T cells it? Are they the only the only answer? Could we actually use a different immune cell to have the same kind of uh, effect and might that be better off? So this is where we introduce NK. So CAR NK or natural killer cells. And we talked about it a little bit last time, but I think there's been quite a pro quite good progress in this area. So the really interesting thing is uh, natural killer cells or NK cells are cytotoxic, very similar to CD8 T cells. So they also deploy perforin and granzyme in little packets. And that's I'm simplifying it because that's not the only way T cells or NK cells kill, but that's a major mechanism. But what's really interesting and cool about NK cells is that they don't use the major histocompatibility complex to recognize whatever their target is, sort of. So they don't need to detect the MHC like the T cell receptor does, but they actually look for loss of the MHC. And it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Um, there's a lot of work that has been done in positive and negative signals. But basically, tumors often try and hide from the immune system. They try to hide from the T cells by downregulating their MHC. Viruses do this too. They try to be clever and they're like, well, you're not going to be able to see that I'm infecting this cell because I'm just going to pull the MHC off the surface. But NK cells are sort of a backup mechanism. And so they look for this missing self or loss of MHC, and that's a positive signal for them to kill. So now if you take an NK cell and you put in the car and they go and they find the tumor, they're not gonna, they're they're not gonna require this MHC. They're not gonna potentially be responding to um, the the the, the MHC from the host and causing this graft versus host disease. So they could potentially be used as an off-the-shelf type of therapy. So I don't know if mm. you guys had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really interesting. And, you know, I think that though it certainly, and this, you know, gives me some questions about, you know, why, you know, did we really, we picked T-cells in the beginning because we knew they made perforin and granzyme, um, you know, what cell does it have to be? Can it be any cell? Can we direct any old cell to killing? Um, and so here, NK cells have this benefit of making perforin and granzyme and this benefit of um, getting activated or getting not deactivated by missing self. Um, and so that makes NK cells really uh, attractive. Um, but it, it just sort of also gives me this broader thought of, you know, what types of cells are the choices. 
Yeah, because you can essentially right. and we'll impart come to other options, right? Other options because you can impart specificity now that we have gene editing to any cell type, and then it just really right. matters what is their capacity to kill, what is their capacity to get into the tumor site, and mm-hmm. what's the plasticity of these cells. So that's an interesting word. In immunology is an ability of a, of, a, of one cell type to become a different subset and maybe move back again depending on the environmental right. cues. Yeah, that's cool. Right. I think we started with T cells because the original uh, cancer immunotherapies were really harvesting T cells from patients' tumors. So excise the tumor, chop up the tumor, Hmm. isolate the T cells, and then grow them in culture. Because the idea was if the T cells are there, they must have been recruited there because they're specific for the tumor. If we could pull them out, grow them up in large numbers, activate them and stick them back in, they would work. And right. unfortunately, we discovered that, yeah, they can potentially do that. But then when they get back in, they don't get into the tumor very well. And when they get into the tumor, they get shut down by all this tumor microenvironment signals that we were talking about. <laughs> so the next thing yeah, was, well, what like, can we do you know, to these T cells <laughs> to make them, you know, more reactive, more specific, get there and do their thing? Yeah, because originally the idea was just that the T cells had been turned off when they went to the tumor and we were going to take them out and turn them back on. Right. And that would solve right. everything. Yep, <laughs> um, it didn't. But clearly not so much. <laughs> so yeah. explain something to me, yep. Cindy. So normally NK cells, they're not antigen specific. They just look for absence of MHC, right? Yes um, and among no. Other- <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, but if you have a virus yeah. infected cell, they're not recognized the viral antigen on the surface, right? So very rarely. So <laughs> okay. yeah. So the thing is, is that viruses, when they infect, will trigger a response in the cell, and the cell actually does upregulate positive signals to activate NK cells. So mm-hmm. it, I, I sort of when I teach it, say you start off here, and you could either lower a negative signal or you could increase a positive signal. Either way, Mm -hmm. it's that difference in signaling that activates an NK cell. And the other other little issue is that there are activating NK receptors and there are inhibitory NK receptors, and Mm -hmm. then there's absence of self, but then they do sometimes have receptors that detect non-classical MHCs and respond to things. So there's a lot of little nuance here that probably is... Is not great to go into in detail now, but we could at some other point go into it. But there is just mm-hmm. a lot that's out there that most immunologists kind of like put under the rug because we don't know quite as <laughs> much about NK cells as we know mm-hmm. about many of the other cell types. And and pretty much everybody just teaches you have positive signals and, and negative signals. And if you miss self because they downregulated them, you see, well, ah, the NK cells are activated. But it's it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. But what what I want to ask is, what are you putting in the NK cells? That you mentioned at the top. What yep. is it that you're putting in? The CAR. So you're putting in the chimeric antigen receptor, the same one that you would be putting in the T cells, but you're going okay, to make a so CAR the, NK instead of a CAR T. Okay. So then my question is, that's really changing the way the NKs are working, right? Yep. That, and that, yes. That's going to work? Does that work? It does work. So what mm. what they started out doing was putting the signaling domains that were on the T cell receptor cars, mm. um, and they would trigger the NKs. But now they are going second, third, fourth generation, and tweaking and tweaking, and they have better uh, signaling domains that are m- more functional in NK cells now. Things like DAP12 and and these other signaling domains that that activate the NK cell really well. But it's the okay. same basic idea as to put a chimeric antigen receptor into the NK cells, and then introduce them back into the person. And the idea is that uh, some of the trials that are being done are actually with an NK cell line. So they are, you know, putting kill switches in them so that they don't cause a problem, but they're, they're, they're transforming those NK cells, which is an NK cell line that some people might, might have heard of as NK92, and they introduce the car into that and then grow them up. And, and basically, mm-hmm. it's like a, a, you know, an, an, a cell biologic that you can just grow and then package and then send off and they inject it into the patient. If you have the right tumor 
antigen, and so your SCFV or your antibody fragment is to the right thing, potentially though that would be an off-the-shelf type therapy. Okay. You know, you mentioned earlier with the CAR T cell that there was an issue of the T cells remaining and killing all the B cells, including bone marrow. Yep. Maybe they sh aren't they putting kill switches in those so they can they, get rid of them when your tumor yep. is gone? Yeah, so they're starting to put kill switches in all of these because they realize that, you know, having them around long term, maybe not yeah. such a good idea. And so some of these, uh, one I mentioned last time um, was the the antiviral thymidine kinase. So you can treat with gencyclovir or acyclovir right. and it's activated and yeah. kills the cell that expresses it, but the cells are perfectly fine without it. And it only kills the cells that are expressing the thymidine kinase. They also have like inducible caspase 9 construct so that when you treat the patient mm -hmm. with a drug, it induces the caspase-9 and that just kills the cells that express caspase-9. Mm -hmm. So you can eliminate them that way. But there's lots of different ways to to put kill switches into these, engineer them into cool. these cells. Right. That, that also brings up another kind of interesting part of the biology of using NK cells versus using T cells. Um, we know that T cells as adaptive immune cells can have memory responses and can be pretty long-lived. Mm -hmm. um, and so... It, you know, in theory, there might be a different lifespan of an NK cell versus a T cell. That could be mm -hmm. good because it wouldn't last as long, or it could be bad because it wouldn't last long enough to kill the tumor. <laughs> um, but that could be another kind of right. feature of the NK cell. Yeah, so they tend to be cleared much faster than the T cells. Uh, the, the trials are showing this, but I guess if you can inject them multiple times, you could potentially control the therapy a bit more than if you just inject once and then just wait and see what happens. I don't know. But they, they do are have there, clinical so for, trials and they are working. Right. So that's good So news. for NK cells, you know, we could envision that durability or how long they last could be, you know, a potential negative. But do they also have the same type? Do, are they able to permeate into the tumor I mean, yeah. I'm assuming maybe better than T cells, but could there be other cells that do a better job of this? So, <laughs> my favorite cell type. <laughs> <laughs> this Macrophages, is perfect for you. Um, yeah. So they are they are starting to use macrophages, and it hasn't gotten as far as a clinical trial, but there is a basic research paper that I was hoping to at least talk a little bit about, where they are uh, making CarMax. <laughs> So macrophages Carmax. expressing <laughs> cars. Yeah, CarMax. There's like a lot the, of very you know, cute, if you a, look at the... <laughs> oh, sorry, Cindy. I think we have a little bit uh, of, a, of a lag. I didn't mean to talk over you. But there are a couple cute, when you look at like, once this paper came out, then all the commentaries, there's like a bunch of cute, like, oh, macrophages get a car. And, you know, all kinds of corny things. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But yeah, so I think the biggest uh, advance now is we're, we're thinking outside the box from T cells. So right. what other kinds of immune cells could you engineer that might, as you said, penetrate the tumor better or have different um, complementary or more effective killing mechanisms? And so what we know about macrophages is that they're actually... Um, if you cut out a tumor, most tumors, the macrophages are actually the most abundant immune cell within a tumor. So I'm mm -hmm. very interested in that. Uh, tumors secrete chemokines that actively recruit monocytes to them. And then, interestingly, the tumor cells orchestrate that microenvironment and can change that macrophage function. So coming back to what Steph said with their these plastic or you know, um, adaptable cells, these macrophages, so you can potentially tweak them once they reach that tumor microenvironment. So my first question in thinking about this, of course, is, but what about the perforin and the granzyme? Yeah, um, you don't and need what them. kind of killing mechanisms uh, do you get with the macrophage? So <laughs> oh, we don't God. need them? Is that <laughs> No, macrophages eat things, right? <laughs> when they engage uh, their receptors, they eat things and they kill them inside. And macrophages are really they can they can engulf and kill tumor cells. And they can they can actually express uh, antigens to trigger, you know, tumor specific T cells if you can get the right situation. So I think the idea here is not so much 
thinking about the cell coming in and deploying a mechanism to kill the tumor cell, but in fact, the cell coming in and eating the tumor cell and killing the tumor cell inside of itself because macrophages are macrophago, so they are big eaters, and they can mm -hmm. eat numerous tumor cells uh, and you know just go around and just keep chewing them up and digesting them and eating them. So, Even a big tumor with many, yeah. many cells? Well, it can't eat the whole tumor at once, but it can chew off individual <laughs> cells and just keep going and chew them up and digest them and, and chew another one and chew another one and chew another one. Mm. Okay. Now, we'll probably go into this in the paper because it's one big question I had. But I've been thinking you know, a lot about macrophages with the SARS-CoV-2 and cytokine release syndrome. And one of the things that would make me very nervous about a therapy where you're giving large amounts of potentially activated, well, monocytes, but then they become activated. They secrete IL-6 and acute phase cytokines. So mm -hmm. I just, uh, I think that we, you would also be dealing with, you know, off-target effects, potential negative consequences. And so engineering them, and you, like you said, they're not that far, I'm sure they're thinking of this, but kill switches, cyt compensatory cytokines. What, what are things to make sure that that person doesn't, you know, go into uh, a cytokine storm? Right. So they've tried to just inject macrophages into patients and see whether they would do anything. And it's quite safe. So you can inject up to 10 to the ninth autologous monocytes or monocyte-derived mm -hmm. macrophages into a human. And they're not going to have too much mm. negative That's response. That's interesting, right? No because cytokine production or anything. Huh. Yeah. So then it must be... No, it's a if different we're, if we're story about if you're the activating. The differences in switches, yeah. Right, like if you have virus replicating, that's the activation that turns on the macrophages to produce higher amounts of IL-6 or whatever. So that does make sense. Right, right. So, yeah, I mean, there's goods and bads on each side. Maybe this will crash and burn if they try to use it in humans. <laughs> but, you know, we can mention a little bit of the data that they they did in, in mouse. Yeah, for sure. And, I, I mean, it looks no. pretty interesting. So, yeah, tell us about it. and tell they us use it. yeah, they so use adenoviruses as well, Vi Vincent. They do. So, mm -hmm. so one of the tricks with macrophages is that they really, really don't like to take up genetic material mm -hmm. because uh, <laughs> they're basically designed to respond to that. Uh, so, if they see viral DNA or RNA, they're going to respond to that, and they have rigai and sting and all these other things in the cytoplasm that basically shut down the you know, production of the cell, you know, the cells shut down, become antiviral state. So they really don't like you to put new material in them. Mm -hmm. But um, adenoviruses seem to be able to get around that a little bit. And so, um, yeah, because my lab has also tried to put things into macrophages, transfection, transduction, retroviral, lentiviral. They just mm -hmm. don't like it. They, yeah, and I was very, excited. Very, very poor transduction. And I was excited because they are actually using the macrophage cell line that I use in my lab to put ah. nucleic acid in and lead to cytokines. THP1. So I just try, yeah, I just use THP1s yeah. and mm -hmm. try to turn on cytokines by giving them nucleic acid. So I'm kind of doing the, the part that Sydney <laughs> mentioned is the bad side of this. And I can tell you it definitely works. Mm -hmm. Well, we need to talk because we're also doing the same thing. We've been trying to introduce things into these cells and they hate us. So oh, I, I was really like excited future, to see this as well. Yeah. A future collab yeah, well, is happening. Yeah. Oh, no. I'm, yeah. We're doing lots of that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I well, might have some tricks so, that we'll have to talk. Yeah. And so adenovirus infection of macrophages. They discussed that macrophages express the docking receptor for AD5 and so that is something that had been known in the past. And these are just the first investigators to utilize this for, for CAR-M therapy? I, I don't think so. I think okay, people so have been maybe somebody before this for a while. That. Sure, um, sure. Yeah, but they definitely were happy to show how robust expression they got. <laughs> That's why they published that. Look, we can transfect or transduce... Yeah. Uh, THP1 cells and certainly impressed me. <laughs> they can impress Brianna. Yeah. Like, now ooh, it's ooh, interesting. Cool. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> well, maybe you could use, so they used an even more unique um, adenovirus vector. It's AD5F35, I think, 
was the name of this vector, but basically they had took some gene from another adenovirus and inserted it into AD5 that then a- allowed for better expression of the gene. So it's, it's um, yeah, you could look into it, but the, it was an even more enhanced adenovirus vector. I didn't know that much about it. So it, to me, it was an adenovirus. <laughs> <laughs> Vincent, did you have any, any thoughts about <laughs> yeah. the nuance of that? <laughs> Yeah, I'm just thinking, you know, a good fraction of the population is going to be immunized with yeah. ad vectors. And I, yep. you know, I noticed yep. they use ad5 here, which is not the basis of J&J or Oxford, but in China, they're using ad5 vectors. So if it works, they should probably pick a different <laughs> vector. Well, right? if, but will it be a, a big problem because they're mostly doing this in vitro? Right. So they would be oh, taking the monocytes yeah. out, oh, right, right. And genetically manipulating them and putting them back in. So it's probably not as much of an issue. Oh, That's yeah. true. Not That's a problem. Cool. Yeah. So yeah. you can yeah. you get to take yeah. advantage of the fact that macro, monocytes, macrophages have this AD5 receptor. You have the enhanced vector that can allow for greater expression. And then you pop them back into people. Cool. Yep. Yep. No so problem. the paper yep. that describes this was published in Nature Biotechnology in 2020. And it is called Human Chimeric Antigen Receptor Macrophages for Cancer Immunotherapy. And the first author is Kliczynski, I think. And um, it has Carl June on it and a couple of other pretty prominent people. The last author is Gill. And so the idea of this paper was, could they do this? Could they introduce a car into their standard human THP1 monocytic cell line, which is THP1 cells. And uh, would they be able to recognize a cancer cell? Would this even work? And so they were able to transduce them um, with this car against CD19. So (laughs) we're not making forward progress that way. We're still at CD19. (laughs) Um, But they tried a bunch of different signaling domains, recognizing what they found with the NK cells, where if you tweak the signaling domain to be more what the the T cells would use versus what the NK cells would use, it might work better. So they tried a couple of different things, including the normal T cell CD3 Zeta, which was the signaling domain that was used in the original cars. Um, and then they they fed them this cell line, K562, and the, the THP1 cells would not eat those target cells unless they were, those target cells were themselves genetically engineered to express CD19. So once you put the CD19 into the target cell, the THP1 cells gobbled them up if they were expressing the CD19 specific car, but not if they were not expressing the the CD19-specific CAR. And so the big thing here is that um, if you cut off the signaling domain so the macrophage could still bind to the target cell, it doesn't actively engulf and kill those target cells unless it has that signaling domain to cause that internalization and activation of the macrophage. So it all looked pretty good, and it wasn't just... Uh, the CD19, they did expand it out a little bit. So they used something called mesothelin and HER2. HER2 is one of the popular ones um, in breast cancer. We know about that. So, you know, could th- could this work in primary cells was, you know, part of the next thing. And, you know, and could, if you injected these things into mice with a tumor, would they just go away or would they actually stay? Would they get into the tumor? A lot of different questions that they were trying to address. So one of the next things they did here was test if these CAR max would then, if you inject them in vivo, could they reduce the tumor burden and prolong survival? Uh, And so for this model, they used an ovarian cancer cell line. That's called SKOV3, which is Sloan Kettering Ovarian Cancer 3. And uh, if they inject the SKOV3 cell line, they get lung metastases. So this is an IV lung metastasis model. And getting a little bit into the nitty gritty, but it's kind of interesting, is they use a humanized mouse <laughs> model. And so this humanized mouse is basically deficient in, in T cells, B cells, and NK cells. And then they've engineered it to express some cytokines and growth factors that 
uh, enhance the growth of human immune cells in the mouse system. So basically, they've nearly ablated the mouse immune system and just basically lo- using it as a bag to put in immune cells and see what happens. But they've got this mouse now that they can reconstitute with human immune cells and with a human tumor and ask, you know, does it work for immunotherapies? So when they do this, they they found that the tumors actually had the macrophages in them, and um, the max expressed the car. The car they had to express the car, and so the whole idea here is you this in this relatively artificial system, quite artificial, not relatively, but you have this mouse that's basically made into a human, and you put the human cancer cell, it grows, and if you give the car max, they kill the human cancer cells. So it all sounds pretty good. What do you guys think about that? Yeah. Well, no, no, it's very cool. Um, I, couple things. So one thing I wanted to ask Cindy was they had discussed the homology between CD3 and a receptor or or a transmembrane domain or the, yes, yes, thank you. The FC gamma chain receptor that um, can interact with the FC receptor on, let's say, antibodies and then can cause the um, phagocytosis. And then we can measure that by something called ADCP assay, antibody-dependent um, cellular phagocytosis, ADCP. So is, are they, did they bring that up to then get us to thinking about how these are u- a unique cell type that, would, that, that CAR T cell in this certain membrane domain can allow for enhanced phagocytosis? Was that what they were leading to? Yeah. Okay. That was my understanding. Uh, okay. The whole goal here, remember, is we're not trying to discharge a killing mechanism, but we're trying to actively engulf the cancer cell. So if you can enhance the, if you can give it a signaling domain that tells the macrophage to engulf um, better, then you'll get better phagocytosis. And I think that cool. their bottom line was, and I didn't write that detail in here, but my understanding was both worked pretty well. Right, right, right. Okay, cool. So it does. So, it, Cindy, it, when, when they, I mean, what's the measure of success? Do they eliminate the tumor or 90%? No. Is, is, so it, it's a pretty mm-hmm. aggressive model. And what they considered successful was if uh, for, a cup, for a couple of days, you had a delay in growth. So it mm-hmm. turns out that if you let them go, mm-hmm they eventually all recover. So this isn't going to be a once one and done thing. And certainly it's just a proof of concept. So there's a lot of tweaking mm-hmm. that needs to happen. I think when they first started the CAR T-cell therapy, it was similar. You know, if you could just get a delay, that was a good thing. Yeah, and when you say they recover, um, you mean the tumor recovers. The tumor and the mouse does not will recover. grow <laughs> and the mouse dies, right. Yeah. And what happens <laughs> to the CARMAX? Do they, do they uh, stick around for a while? So they do, they measured them up. So not with the tumor, actually, but with just just injecting the CAR max. They, and they, they did this really cool thing. They engineered them to also express a luciferase so they could follow them. And there are these cool IVIS pictures. You know, they can, mm-hmm. you can image the, ma- the mouse. You inject them with a luciferase substrate and they, poof, they glow. And you can measure this. Mm-hmm. And you can see where the, the dots are, where the cells are that are expressing that luciferase. And so you can see what tissues they go into. But they were able to do this and they could see those cells still in the tissues up to 62 days later in a mouse. So that's not mm-hmm. too bad. Right. Yeah. So why did the tumor outrun the max? The yeah, car max? Probably, <laughs> probably because of this tumor microenvironment issue. So, I, I mean, one of yeah, the big that things TME. that's being studied these mm. days is, you know, and, and we're doing some work on this too. The tumor microenvironment orchestrates everything. And basically, one mm. of the things it does really well is drive macrophages away from pro-tumor, you know, um, uh, anti-tumorogenic phenotypes and, and makes them promote the growth of the tumor. So the, the mm-hmm. tumor cells secrete mm-hmm. factors and vesicles that then drive the macrophages to produce pro-tumorogenic factors and enhance their growth. So, you know, it's probably going to require 
tweaking and co-expression of additional molecules to prevent the shutting down of the tumor cells. So one of the things we're going to want to know is what are the signals that the tumor cells give the macrophages to shut the signal, you know, to shut the macrophages down? How do we interrupt them? Can we keep the macrophages invigorated to kill the tumor cells? Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of what's going on right now in the tumor cancer macrophage um, research realm. Right. Because one of the things that they brought up was that the the vector itself, so the ad5 vector itself, increased yeah. the max to be more pro-inflammatory or this M1 phenotype. But then yeah. of course you take, you know, the you take the vector away and you put the 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 cells back in. And so then once they get into another micro environment, I'm assuming then they're sh- you know, they go back to the M2 phenotype. Although did they they did mention that you know, they stayed M1, which is the pro-inflammatory, even after addition of yeah. like IL-4 or different things. But after 62 days, I don't think they took them out to see what they were up to. Is that correct? I don't, I don't remember that. Okay. No, yeah, so they, you know, yeah. So, so you're right. Just the adenovirus alone, mm-hmm. even without the car, activated the macrophages and surprisingly gave them an interference signature. You know, who would have known you infect them with a virus? And they virus. Make interference. Oh my gosh. That's a shocker. shocker. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but that's what they got. But yeah, so the big thing was, you know, could they, could they make them inflammatory and would those cells retain their inflammatory signature when they're in the tumor? And so, yeah, they Which, did an again, experiment. Go, and, that, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Well, oh, I was thinking, well, you know, going back to my say, question of off. <laughs> <laughs> I think this delay, oh, we're so funny, are we? Um, so, okay, so my my comment was more just, you know, yes, before they did give people up to 10 of the ninth macrophages and didn't see, you know, a rejection or they seemed to do fine, but they did not activate those macrophages with an adenovirus vector and make them all a pro-inflammatory M1 phenotype. So I'm thinking you inject people with a huge amount of activated macrophages and I would worry about the potential effects of those macs before they even make it to the tumor. And then you have to make sure people don't get like, you know, a viral infection while these macrophages are also trying to do their thing. So some additional things that testing in mice maybe wouldn't answer those questions for me. Yeah, well, the mice aren't going to tell you if they feel bad. You can look to see if they're hunching and whatever, but and yeah. you can measure cytokines and, and markers, but you really wouldn't know mm-hmm. until you try it. But you're right. I, I mean, certainly macrophage activation syndrome is a huge problem. Um, it's not very common, but you know those people who have this familial disease are are really bad off, and it's it has you know it's quite fatal. So over you know overactivating macrophages everywhere in the body is not a good thing. The hope is that if you're putting a car in them, they're, you know, homing mm-hmm. to the tumor. And so you're delivering those relatively locally. But, Good point. but certainly Good point. it's going to come at a cost of, you know, cytokine release syndrome and other inflammatory problems. Always a trade-off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they did, they did a whole bunch cool. of other things. Yeah, they, you know, they did a whole so, bunch of other things in single cell sequencing. But the, the bottom line was that they could, they could show that this actually worked. And, and, and in fact, they could show that the macrophages, which an experiment I will not go into, is a very, very complex experiment, but they could present an, tumor antigens. So the idea would be the macrophages yeah. go in, they mm-hmm. eat the tumor cells, which is one, good, a good thing. They're going to get rid of the tumor cells. But at the same time they're getting activated they're also going to cross present potential tumor specific Mm -hmm. antigens that are expressed in those tumor cells and then be able to activate additional t cells so additional cd8 t cells who then could be called in to to respond and they have some preliminary evidence to suggest that you don't need former you know specific antigen specific T cells but that this cross presentation by these car max could induce a polyclonal T cell response that could then be requ- recruited in to help kill the tumor yeah and that could also sort of try to combat the immunosuppressive environment a little bit right um, yeah. by inducing a little bit of inflammation there and that would be something yeah. unique that the max could do better than the NK cells because while there are some very rare populations of NK cells that are doing very weird things like recognizing antigens specifically. 
other than them, um, that's not a function that NK cells are really known for. So Macs are going to do a better job of that. Right. That's right. Because they're antigen presenting cells. Right. So there are CAR DCs. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, people are starting to think about this. Can we, can we make antigen presenting cells target to the tumor, specifically with the, you know, the targeting CAR, mm. and then promote antigen presentation and, and spread this response, activate more T cells, recruit more T cells in. So all of those are, you know, things that people are thinking about to, you know, tweak and improve this uh, CAR therapy to potentially combat, you know, more common solid tumors versus just the liquid tumors. And, and Cindy, what's the percentage of monocytes that you can, mm -hmm. that are circulating in our blood? Or at least, are they more, oh, I, I there, there's more of them than T cells. Not a lot, like less yes. than 10%. Oh, I was going to, I thought it was more than that. Was it more okay. than 10%? I, I feel like the, the slide that I show is neutrophils 50 to 70 and monocytes yeah. 20 to 40. Maybe, yeah. B cells are 20-ish, okay. so okay. yeah. But essentially, we Probably could more. say that if we yep. pulled a mill of blood or you know a liter of blood from somebody, you would be able to get more, ma uh, more monocytes than T cells. So in terms of you know, how many you can acquire from a person, this could be yes. more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. But I love it. Yeah. I mean, I, of course, yes, I, I didn't mean to and be. And they don't proliferate as well as T cells. <laughs> right. 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 So, yeah. They, yeah. So, I mean, they do, but not, not, I mean, T cells, you put them in culture, you give them anti CD3, anti CD28, and some IL2, and you can just make liters and liters and liters of T cells. True. NK cells are a little trickier. They don't, they don't proliferate as well, but you can give them IL-15 and you can keep them alive and you can expand them to some degree, especially if you start with stem cells, which is what they're trying to do. Um, they're not starting with blood NK cells because they're so few. We talk about a few cells, so that's very low. Um, but they're starting with um, precursor cells from cord blood and differentiating them into large mm -hmm. numbers of NK cells. Monocytes, you know, it's probably a little trickier and a little harder. Sure, sure. Interesting. So well, I love the paper. Advantages it definitely got me thinking about on each side. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Oh yeah. I'm super excited about the paper. I'm like ready to go get my THP one cells and <laughs> get going. <laughs> Put cars in them, yeah. Give them little wheels and let them drive. Exactly. Around. Perfect. <laughs> and thank you to Add Five for being this very um, you know, unique vector that they could use to actually make this work in primary models. Yeah. Yeah, who would have known that some basic research on how viruses work would come in handy, huh? <laughs> right, exactly. Yes. Who would have thought? <laughs> we all knew that, but... <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's important to tell people this because uh, these things just don't pop out, right? They, the ability to, to make viral vectors depends on years of research to understand what the genes do and which mm -hmm. ones you can take out. and Right, Pretty sure. esoteric stuff until it becomes life saving, right? Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, and um, and so COVID nineteen we can't exactly get away from even in this episode mm -hmm. because I thought another really cool thing. Now, granted, it's a very small paper; it's a bioarchive preprint, mm -hmm. um, and it's only in vitro. But I had this idea last summer, and I hadn't <laughs> done it. But could you could you make a car using the antibodies that are available that recognize SARS-CoV-2 spike protein mm -hmm. and then allow those cells to then attack virally infected cells? And you can do it because this is an enveloped virus that puts the spike protein on the surface of the virally infected cells because it's you know taken with it as it escapes out of the cell. And so could you actually introduce a macrophage, introduce a car into a macrophage that recognizes the spike protein and then the macrophages could go and find the virally infected cells and eliminate them. And so they were able to do it in vitro, very artificial system, uh, using, you know, uh, target cells, Vero cells that express the spike protein or are in sort of infected with a pseudotyped VSV virus that expresses the SARS-CoV-2 protein. But they could introduce it into the THP1 cells and introduce a CARMAC that targets the SARS-CoV-2 and they would eliminate those virally infected cells. So, mm -hmm. kind of cool. Do you think that this would be a better, better um, 
technology or strategy for latent viruses, just because that SARS-CoV-2 is going to be leaving the body quite quick before you can get all that done? Maybe like a herpes virus? I... I think it's a, it's a toss up. It would depend entirely on whether that latent virus is actively producing a protein that can right. be recognized by the car. If that latent virus is really truly silent and it's not making any genes, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't think you're going to be able to to find it. Yep. Like and then that's the, simplex. Like herpes, right? And then that's the problem for HIV because they're changing their, I mean, the, the antigens are changing all the time. So one car is, they're just going to shift. It's not going to do the job. Yeah. Well, what they're doing with HIV is just eliminating the CD4 T cells. So if right. you could introduce a car that would target CD4 and just wipe out any cell that expresses CD4 and then mm. turn on the kill switch. If you've eliminated all of the latent reservoirs in, <laughs> which is a whole other issue, potentially that's, you could that, cure That's them. the hard thing. Uh-huh. Right. <laughs> right. So I, I don't yeah. know how practical that is, but that's, that's sort of the idea. But I mean, the they're doing five. things like taking the T-cells out of the HIV patient and using CRISPR to take out the HIV and then... Yeah reinfusing the T cells back into the person so they're just going to get infected with HIV again but i guess if you keep giving right. them enough of their own T cells back and you keep carving out the uh, you know using crispr to take out the HIV maybe that would work i don't know but you'll never get every last cell that's the problem with that mm-hmm. right that's the yeah. problem yeah, yeah. so th- this T cell the the car mac for uh, SARS-CoV-2 I-, I was it's interesting but i was on a call last night with um a couple of people, Ron Germain was there. And yeah. They were talking about T cells and, and COVID. And he said, you know, the only issue is T cells are great early in infection, but late mm-hmm. it's going to screw people up. Yep. You know, that's these people with this inflammatory yeah, disease right. or whatever. So, and that's the problem. You don't know who to give it to early. Mm-hmm. So even if you had this, yeah, that's, that's what that's I tough. could, is at least one issue anyway. Well, there's a lot of issues, but a lot, yeah. Yeah, well, indeed. Cindy, you were nervous in the beginning, indeed. but you did an excellent job. This might rival our first one. Plus, we have Brianne. So it's like, you know, it's better yeah. for that. Well, I think it was fun. It was, it was fun, great. definitely, to go back and dig in the literature and look at what has been done since the last time we talked about this. Yeah, that's awesome. And so, you know, for those of you who made it this far, if you really are still not quite sure what the car is, I really encourage you to go back and look at, listen to the other episode because it was really quite detailed in exactly how you make these, how you get the patient blood out, you know, how all of this therapy works. Um, and so I think both of them together are really, it's really nice. It's fun to revisit. And it's fun to learn all this new stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. I love Cindy. it. I, I, yeah. You guys want to do like three email before we sure. sign off? Would that work sure. for you guys? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, let's do it. So the, uh, this first one is quite interesting. Who who did the DE cell? Was that Cindy or Steph? Remember the dual expression? Uh, I don't oh, remember. yeah, I did the that. The oh. and the TCR. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, yeah, it, and there was okay. controversial. So why don't you take uh, that first email? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Alberto writes, "Hello, immunes." Back in immune episode twenty-one, you covered a paper by Ahmed et al. describing an intriguing novel lymphocyte expressing both the BCR and TCR, which which the authors named a dual expressor cell. The paper showed that the DE cells, although rare, were more frequently found in type one diabetes patients that then in healthy controls and seem to carry a public BCR that was shared between individuals, uh, parentheses X clonotype. Additionally, the authors claim that the CDR3 sequence of the X clonotype encoded a potent T-cell autoantigen uh, oh. when bound to the DQ8, HLA, okay. or well, MHC. She's not going to read um, that email. For those who aren't familiar with that. You can use those frequently. That's MHC is the human version. Class 2 allele. Okay, I'm going to read that lesson. Uh, Additionally, the authors claim that the CDR3 sequence of the X clonotype encoded a potent T-cell autoantigen when bound to the DQ8 HLA class 2 allele. As you mentioned in the episode, these findings, if correct, would implicate uh, dual expressor cells and their X clonotype in the pathogenesis of type 1 diabetes and open several opportunities for the diagnosis and treatment. 
we set out to replicate two of their major findings, the increased frequency of DE cells in the blood and the presence of public exclonotypes in type 1 diabetic patients. Using a flow cytometry panel identical to the one used by Ahmed and running samples at two independent institutions by blinded investigators, we were unable to replicate the increased frequency of dual expressor cells in the blood of type 1 diabetic patients. Additionally, we did not find enrichment of these cells in lymphoid tissues such as pancreatic lymph nodes and spleen. We searched for the sequence of this exclonotype in B cells from 92 individuals and pretty much split 40 type 1 diabetic and 52 controls uh, amounting to approximately 1.6 million clonotypes and did not find it. Our data was published by Cell as a matters arising paper together with a reply written by the authors of the original DE paper. So I do remember this. And so that's why I said um, controversial Mm. because I remember the commentary coming out. And I, I think this investigator is also on Twitter and there was like some back and forth, which I found interesting. Um, In the interest of fairness, I'd like to encourage listeners to read both papers. I agree. Um, A previous paper by Julie Burrell published in Cytometry Part A had already raised concerns about technical difficulties in discerning cell-to-cell complexes in flow cytometry and single-cell sorting, which, side note for those who have listened to Immune for a while, Cindy has brought this up quite a bit. I brought this up. Flow cytometry for rare events, you really have to run a lot of controls. You have to repeat the experiment multiple times because cells are sticky. You need to make sure that your cytometer is working appropriately. All I mean, there's many different things that can um, lead to potential errors in these rare cells. Um, and so this, this writer uh, writes on, we did not try to question the existence of BCR-TCL dual expressing lymphocytes because it was impossible to prove without a doubt that it does not exist, right? Like trying to prove a negative. Instead, we focus on its alleged associated with type 1 diabetes and unfortunately for T1D patients, we're unable to replicate the original findings. Thank you for the work you put into Immune and the Microbe TV family of podcasts. I've been listening to them for over 10 years. That's so nice. They have been stable companions through grad school and postdoc on two continents. They're fantastic instruments of scientific communication and critical thinking. Well, thank you, Alberto Jap from uh, Berlin, Germany. And yes, I remember this back and forth. It's fascinating. Uh, Science, you know, it's it's a field filled with humans and we do tend to... um, enjoy the drama. So I think that I did enjoy the little back and forth. And I think it's worthwhile to, to read both those papers um, when considering the existence of these dual expressor cells. Any more thoughts on that? Uh, <laughs> si- uh, sorry. Um, thank you. Um, st- um, yeah. Brianne, can you take the next one? <laughs> sure. Rich writes, Dear esteemed immune hosts, A BBC radio program covered a recent Nature paper. Gut-educated IgA plasma cells defend the meningeal venous sinuses by Fitzpatrick et al. It looks important given the role of IgA in the brain was not appreciated and might be worth covering on a future program. Um, And he gives a link. Many thanks for all the episodes and please keep podcasting. Rich. Um, So I have not looked into this paper much. Um, Is this something we should uh, talk about at some point? Yes, it's so cool. It's bomb. Yeah, I love it. I'm, yeah. But I'm always like screaming about IGA. Okay. I love IGA. <laughs> I know. Okay, so Steph, as the IGA person, is the one to ask. So, Steph, <laughs> would you do this paper in a future episode? Absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to. Okay, great. great. Um, Cindy, can you take the next one? Sure. Anne writes, hello, I'm a lymphatic cancer survivor two years now. I had a right anterior hemiglossectomy and a right cervical dissection with removal of 33 lymph nodes and three were positive for metastasis. I also survived botulina toxicity five years ago. My question is, with my given history, is it safe for me to continue to donate blood? I have not given since I had botulina toxicity. Thanks. Anne. Hmm. I, I, would not think that it would be okay for somebody who has survived um, mm. a lymphatic cancer to donate blood, but I don't know. Do you any have either, any of you know? I, do I don't know, know but it, but it doesn't sound like a good idea, right? No, yeah, because I once like, you have I metastatic mean, yes. cancer, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Cindy. Sorry. I was just going to say, once you have metastatic cancer, there's no guarantee 
that you're you don't have a reservoir of of metastatic right. cells sitting somewhere, and if you donate blood, you could potentially donate those metastatic cells. Right. And then when you donate blood, right. and you're having to, you know, you still got bone marrow, so you can still produce more cells. But then, are you triggering something? Do we want to be messing with that? Like your body's already gone through enough, so. I'll yeah. donate blood for but you. But if it was the <laughs> in your place. Yeah, I mean if it's the botulina issue, I I mean I think if you've survive Yeah, I think that's botulina fine. toxin I you survive. There's no there's not going to be any more bacteria around that I know right. of. So I think it would be fine, but the cancer I would be worried about. All right, last one from Mark. Uh, with respect to the latest episode on herd immunity. This is Twiv. <laughs> This is not mute. <laughs> we got slid All in right, there. let me skip that. Let's, let's go to the, yeah, I'm I'm obviously out of control. Yasu writes, Dear Immune and Twiv team. Now this is to both. I don't know why. I'm very impressed by hearing the exciting discussion Immune episode 36, which I, I don't even know what, what it was about, right? We had Alex Dent I on felt, and we were talking, you know, T flick, you'll help, the, help the, yourself. Yeah, the, the germinal okay. center paper. Oh, lovely. Yeah, that was cool. Very cool. I'm, All right. I I'm felt talking the result. about in class on Friday. Oh. Excellent. I feel the results showing the absence of T TFH from lymph nodes of severe COVID-19 patients might be important in several ways. Germinal center is an important architecture for affinity maturation and class switching of antibodies in the germinal center. B-cell clones rapidly proliferate in the dark zone and produce somatic hypermutation of antigen binding sites. Only high affinity B cells are allowed to survive in the light zone of GC with interaction with TFH and follicular dendritic cells. I'm wondering whether SARS-CoV-2 could infect FDCs, mm. which are epithelial origin, and then the formation of GC structure is hampered. Another point resides in the initial activation of na naive T cells by dendritic cells in the T cell area in the context of MHC2 and antigenic peptides. If the initial activation is not strong enough, T-cells can express an insufficient level of BCL6. This leads to lack of CXCR5 expression, the receptor for CXCL13. Such T-cells may stay in the T-cell area and may be involved in the extra follicular B-cell differentiation. Such B-cells are believed to be short-lived, low affinity due to the lack of selection process in the GC and stay in the lymph nodes. Third, if I remember correctly, the expression of BCL6 inhibits differentiation of activated T cells into other T cell subsets, including Th1, 2, and 17, because Th1 cells also produce TNF. A blockade of TFH pathway could result in the overproduction of TNF from Th1 cells. Vaccines that can create GC, unlike natural infection, may be good ones. That's from Yasuyuki Imai, who is at the University of Shizuoka School of Pharmaceutical Sciences in Japan, who appears to know what they're talking about. <laughs> yes. I yeah. think they sound like really interesting ideas. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, but I don't think that SARS cov 2 anyone can heard? For, go ahead. I don't know. The, um, I don't think so. FDCs. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't think they can infect I FDCs. I don't know if anyone's looked know. right. But it's interesting. Has anyone looked further at, at uh, these germinal centers in severe COVID patients? Does anyone know? I know there's another paper about extra follicular B cell responses yeah. um, that came out shortly after that one, but I don't know of any further papers on this as yet. Okay. Me neither. All right. Good, we got some COVID in there. Marker here. We did get some COVID in there. Right. Okay, that'll do it for Immune 42. You can find uh, the show notes at microbe.tv slash immune. If you have questions or comments, please send them to immune at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Cindy Leifer is at Cornell University on Twitter. Cindy Leifer. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. This was fun. Steph Langles at Duke University. Stephanie Langle on Twitter. Thanks, Steph. Yeah, thank you. Brian Barker is at Drew University. Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. 
We'll be back next month.